and welcome again, my gentle and of course very modern apes, to another episode of the Library of Error. You may notice that my setup is a little bit different, and that's because I've moved. My fiancé and I purchased a house, and we have been moving all week, which is why you've seen less content from me. And in addition to that, starting grad school and starting teaching has been a lot. But I'm more than excited to get back to our journey dealing with one of my favorite horrible texts. In fact, it, it might actually be one of the worst things committed to paper, committed to being bound in a book format that, that I've ever read. So allow me to pull up the, uh, the Library of Error jail, if you will, which contains our next book as well, which is going to be Contested Poems. Oof. Just knock that. You're going to have to deal with that, guys. So allow me to free our, <laughs> our crew. You guys like these theatrics? I think they're fun, but maybe it's just me. I've also lost my voice a little bit. I was teaching osteology this week, which involved a whole lot of lecture and a whole lot of rambling to my three lab classes in biological anthropology. So you'll have to forgive me if I'm feeling a little bit raspier than normal, but it may offset some of the more nasally... Uh, attributes to my typical cadence. As I previously mentioned, we are going to be finishing off Why Human Evolution is False, the scientific case for independent origins. Has Ape to Man Evolution been overturned by YouTuber Standing for Truth, or as we affectionately call him around here, Monkey for Banana. This section that we're going to be going through today, the last section, is uh as I mentioned last time, a bit of a doozy because it is, again, by Raw Matt. Who better to round off a text as robust as this than the most incompetent human being that I have ever seen attempt to actually write a book? So this is titled Cladistics by Raw Matt, and the nice thing about this chapter, it, it, sorry, appendix, is that it is very long, and it also includes silly memes along with the normal and standard ripped pictures without citation or attribution. Some of this is going to seem a little bit familiar, so I might actually go ahead and clip out a bit from another video and place it in because I've already kind of done it. It's it's the skunk cladistics thing that he does where it's like, ooh, you know, what if we uh, what if we ask a bunch of scientists where humans belong? You could end up with skunks being just the most closely related to humans rather than um, the, the other hominoids and most specifically members of genus Pan. But I might not, we'll see. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, these things aren't scripted, these ones that I do uh, for the Library of Error. I, it's mostly just reading something I've previously annotated and going off of that. Um, most cuts are so that I can set up links um, for previously noted sources that will kind of help elucidate um, how wrong and exactly why the given passage that we're looking at is so egregiously incorrect. So I'm excited to get started, but I do actually have to refill my tea before we get started. So give me a quick break. That's some free ASMR for you guys, as usual. And, and you know, I still get plaque from the, uh, from the noodle crunching. Let's begin. When people say young earth creationists have never mentioned hierarchies, they have no idea what they're talking about. This is because the very biological classification system itself was introduced by Carl Linnaeus in 1735, which explicitly recognized the hierarchical nature of species relationships. So I'm going to stop right there. Carl Linnaeus is infamous for recognizing that humans were hominoids, right? We're so incredibly close to the other primates, the other catarines, and most specifically, the apes. If memory serves, the way that this specifically went down was he actually saw a gibbon skeleton. He saw the, the uh, anatomy, the skeletal anatomy of these other apes and was like... <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> In fact, I, I believe it was Carl Linnaeus who proposed that the other apes be elevated up into um, Anthropoidea or something along those lines, a, uh, a group that would include humans and the other apes, but elevated them to our status rather than denigrating humans and placing them down with the other lowly animals. Um, 
do you guys think Romat is gonna recognize that? You think he's gonna touch on that and maybe, oh, I don't know, mention how how very similar humans and other apes are when compared to other animals? Since you know the skunk situation with the taxonomy, the answer is, of course, no. And it's quite funny that he mentions hierarchies in the hierarchical nature of species relationships, because that would make it very difficult to do that activity that he does with the skunks later, but I digress. Sadly, it has become a political tool to push evolutionism. That is some tinfoil stuff if I ever heard it. I am now going to expose how taxonomists move things around as they please and how they have now invented their own new system to replace the old which contradicted them. Except, except, <laughs> Linnaean hierarchical classification, one, since phylogeny has come along, yes, certain terminal ends of, ends of these branches have changed, but by and large, Morphology did an okay job at placing things in in the proper area. The only thing that the only thing really that genetics showed that raw mat is going to be upset about is just how close humans are to the other apes. But I mean, it's called phylogenetics, yes, but Linnaean taxonomy is still heavily studied by. I mean, you 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 usually will get exposure to it in general biology classes. Um, morphology can be a really good tool, and it's usually recapitulated in phylogeny in, in many cases. Not always, but um, he's painting it, though, like Linnaean taxonomy said this one thing, you know, humans are this unique critter, and evolutionism didn't like that because, I don't know, they want humans to be animals so that we can sin or some nonsense like that. And so then they explicitly invented phylogenetics to like lump humans with the other apes. I, it's very silly. I mean, again, it's always painted like there's this nefarious cabal in a gothic castle discussing how to undermine creationism as if creationism is even like tangentially on a single dendrite in the minds of any scientist working today. Um, no one cares. Sorry, Ramat. I do, but that's because this is a fun hobby to me. Since evolutionists are always trying to make sure everything is related somewhere on the family tree, they now use cladistics slash taxonomy as evidence for evolution when it is literally nothing but a classification system. If it was literally nothing but a classification system, where's the line and why is it drawn there? Again, this always comes back down to the kinds. It comes back down to these guys will consult Linnaean taxonomy, but really they're actually consulting phylogenetics. They just don't know it in order to lump all the cats into Philidae and say Philidae is a kind. But then they buck that when it comes to humans with the rest of the hominoids. It's not literally nothing but a classification system. It is a classification system, but classification in biology tends to necessitate some kind of relation unless you can show somehow empirically that there's a line at some level, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the analogy that I use here that I tend to use is if you're looking at something like gravity, right? Uh, gravity within the Earth's atmosphere. It would be like saying, yes, I accept gravity but only to seven feet. Once you go past seven feet, gravity doesn't work the way that, that it typically is expected to. Um, okay, uh, hypothesis, sure. Why? What, what's the reason? Why would you propose that gravity stops working at seven feet? The analogy here is why does relatedness and phylogenetics and cladistics stop at arbitrary places? All cats are related, but not past the cats. Right? Cats and dogs aren't related. Cats and otters aren't related. Why? Where's the line? Why is it drawn there? You see, Carl Linnaeus, known as the father of modern taxonomy, had to place man somewhere on his newly created taxonomic chart. Linnaeus decided to place humans among the primates in the first edition of Systema Natura because apes, in all caps, had physical similarities to man, not the other way around. Yeah, okay, good job, Ramat. That's what I just said. Man, monkeys, sloths, and apes were under the same category. Anthropomorpha, so not anthro, anthropomorphidae, anthropomorpha, meaning man-like. That's true. 
Good job, Rahman. Linnaeus never believed man was an ape nor related to one. He simply wanted to put humans into a category for classification purposes. No, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> He believed that these organisms shared similar enough characteristics to be in the same group. Putting humans with the apes and sloths would be exactly analogous to elevating them to the human level, like functionally speaking. It's the same thing. It is the same thing. Now, Linnaeus, of course, did this without understanding or being aware of common descent, because Darwin came much later than Linnaeus did. That being said, the fact that he's lumping humans in with these other organisms tacitly concedes that humans are, of course, animals, and that humans are most similar to the apes, that they belong in the same group. So what that would say isn't that, okay, well, humans aren't related to other apes, but they are apes, right? They are the same kind of animal, if you will. This is also the stance that um, the author of this book takes, that humans are, of course, apes, but that we're not related to any other apes. Thanks again, standing for that. Always appreciate that honesty. Carl noticed that biologists were thinking the same thing as most people today. Why are you categorizing man with ape? Carl answers this in a letter to biologists named Gemellen in 1747. He said, it does not please you that I've placed man among anthropomorpha, perhaps because of the term with human form, but man learns to know himself. Let's not quibble over words. I will apply the same to whatever name we apply. That's, yes, that is that is saying it doesn't matter if we put humans in anthropomorpha, or rather put the rest of the apes in anthropomorpha, or put humans in pongaday, whatever we want to lump the, the non-human apes into. Um, it, it's the same concept, right? It's noting similarity. Linnaeus was a creationist, true. He was never trying to say man was an ape, and he was vocal about it and said not to use it for that purpose. Nope, <laughs> none of that, none of that, uh, tracks at all. Linnaeus couldn't be a, quote, creationist in the sense that Ramat wants to use it here as in opposition to evolution, because evolution had not been brought up as a theory yet in time, right? Linnaeus was a naturalist, right? He was a guy who was making, you know, uh, observations about the similarities of organisms in nature, right? He wasn't an anti-evolutionist concerned that humans would be, you know, debased as these animals because he knew humans were animals. That's why he put them in the classification of life and not somewhere else on this different distal branch. But his system now is used by evolutionists to portray this very thing he said not to. He uses the wrong to here, not to. And now they have twisted his system to use it for evidence as evidence for their own theory. See for yourself. Then he has like a, it's literally like a, like a pick pick grab from, uh, from Google. Um, Ramat is like really tangled in his own web here. I don't know how many times I can say it, but like Linnaeus was noting that humans were most similar to other apes and other apes were most similar to humans. And so they should be in a group together called Anthropomorpha. It had absolutely nothing to do with, with this anti-evolution uh, crusade that Ramat wants to paint it as, because again, evolution hadn't been, quote, invented, unquote, yet. Linnaeus was just classifying life, that's it. And he knew, just as well as everyone else who would come along after him, that humans and apes were very similar, because humans are apes. Just like biologists back in his day thought the same thing, which is why they were mad because they were Christian creationists. Well, now they love it because today they are secular naturalist atheists. That is incoherent. So to strengthen their case in modern times that humans are apes and should remain in the taxonomic tree branch, scientists recently clipped together five physical features that humans supposedly share in common with apes to peddle that man belongs to the ape family. But basically, they're just playing a language game. Just like the US Post Office has a system for naming states, including two-letter abbreviations. They will change the system if it suits them. At one time, we had state abbreviations such as MASS, in parentheses, for Massachusetts, and CALIF, in parentheses, for California. They could have done it with anything. I can do it with a raccoon. Look. And then he, <laughs> he's got a, some raccoons doing anthropomorph anthropomorphic shit. Um, I don't even really know what to say about all this. It's it's like it's like listening to 
It's like listening to like a five-year-old talk about Power Rangers or something. I, I know that's really mean and maybe not a perfect one-to-one, but I mean it because it's it's incoherent and like it's so off the wall in different directions. Like, what does what exactly does post office abbreviations have to do with the classification of life? He just got done praising Carl Linnaeus's work, so like, why are we suddenly upset? He's saying it's being used to push humans are apes, but it's not being used. That's just what it says, right? I mean, that's like saying Newton's New, Newton's Principia Mathematica is being used to push the globe. Yes, because it shows that the Earth is a globe. I, I don't know. I don't know. So what we start getting into next is Ramat's attempt at delegitimizing humans being a part of the family Hominoidea or Hominidae. And it is difficult to understate just how much he bungles this. It is abundantly clear, almost more so than any other section of this entire text, that he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. So in order to really highlight what we're about to go over, I thought I would go ahead and elucidate why it is that humans are considered to be apes or members of hominidae, uh, hominoidea or uh, hominidae, depending. I think hominoidea is actually the superfamily and hominidae is actually the family level. But I like using hominoidea because it actually includes the gibbons and you guys know how much I like gibbons. So what you can see in the background here are my slides actually from the very first debate that I had on YouTube with Kent Hovind. My goal was to show just from a morphological standpoint, right? I'm not even including like the, the phylogenetics here. We're using what Raw Matt likes, which is Linnaean taxonomy using morphologic characteristics to place organisms in a hierarchical fashion. Something he explicitly said, although I don't think it's, I think it's because he didn't know what he was talking about, that he explicitly said was okay to do in this text. So the first thing that he says before we, I guess, start with this is he goes, what's funny is even the five things that unite humans and, um, and the other apes that they say we have in common are vastly different, two exclamation marks. Let's look at them, shall we? And then he brings up the five of the numerous characteristics that unite members of hominidae, which are actually, this is uniting members of hominoidea, which are the Y5 molar pattern, the rotating shoulder, a lack of a tail, a posteriorly positioned scapula, fully fused caudal vertebra, and a large and complex brain. So we're gonna go over that shortly. You'll see a lot of my skulls have disappeared. That's because we're gonna have a skull demonstration very shortly. But first, let's talk a little bit about <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about um, phylogenetics slash cladistics slash taxonomy. Let's talk about why we are where we are in the animal kingdom. Now, I'm starting here with primates, and the reason I'm starting with primates is because it is almost universally accepted by every creationist that we're mammals. It's interesting because they'll often be like, yeah, okay, we're mammals, but we're not, we're mammals, but we're not animals. But like, animalia is that's kingdom level classification, right? That's significantly higher up. You have to be an animal in order to be a mammal. All mammals are animals, but not all animals are mammals. Um, that's just how this works. But since we all agree that we're mammals and Ramat does so later in this text, we're gonna start with primates. We're gonna start with why we are primates and not carnivorans, or why we're primates and not um, members of rodentia, it, these kinds of things. So humans are primates. And what I want you to keep in mind while we're going through this is that this is true whether or not humans are involved, right? If an alien species came and investigated the paleontology of Earth out long after humans are gone and never found a human specimen, they would still be able to unite all primates, all catarines, all apes with these characteristics that we're about to go over. But if they came up with this classification system and then found a human, therein lies why we're placed where we are, because a human has all of the characteristics that each of these levels has. So for instance, 
All primates have large brains even when accounting for body size. They have binocular color vision, they have these grasping dexterous hands that end in digits that are tipped with fingernails rather than claws, and they have flexible shoulder girdles for arboreal lifestyles and unique locomotion patterns on the ground, like bipedality in humans or terrestrial, terrestrial quadrupedalism in baboons or macaques. So. All primates have these characteristics, from lemurs to tarsiers to, um, to gibbons to chimpanzees to guinins, all of them have these characteristics. And this is what separates them from the rest of the mammals. Any animal that has this suite of characteristics, critically what Ramat doesn't understand is that it isn't one of these characteristics that unites something into the order of primates. You have to have all of these characteristics to be a primate. Right? Dolphins have large brains when accounting for body size, but they don't have these grasping dexterous hands, they don't have unique shoulders that are built for adaptation in the trees and on the ground, and so they don't get to be, excuse me, I hit that again, I get emphatic. So they don't get to be primates right? You have to have all of the traits. This is why they are sweets and not individual traits that lump organisms into categories. So the next, after primates, is the differentiation between strepsirines and haplorines, or wet-nosed versus dry-nosed primates. To be a haplorine, you have to have dry noses. Lemurs have wet noses, so while they are primates, they aren't haplorines. They also don't have the ability to synthesize vitamin C, that is, the haplorines don't. So tarsiers, all old world monkeys, all new world monkeys, none of these guys have the ability to synthesize their own vitamin C because their gulo gene is broken. Um, they also don't have split lips. A lemur has a split lip in the front, right? They have the little split lip with the whiskers, um, and haplorines don't. But we do have the remnant of it. This little divot in the front is, is our remnant. We also have post-orbital plates rather than post-orbital bars. This is something that lemurs have post-orbital bars. We have post-orbital plates. Um, so if you have all of these traits and also all of these traits, you are a haplorine primate, right? If you have all of these traits that primates have, but you lack this suite of characteristics, you are a strepsirine primate. Let's take it a step further. Simiaforms or anthropoid primates have all of the previous characteristics that we just mentioned, but they also have an even larger brain to body size ratio, right? The brain of a gibbon compared to its body size is significantly larger than a tarsier's brain to its body size. Um, these guys also have these unique derived social organizations and they have unique structures with regard to the hind feet, the teeth, and the orbits. We can mention things like social organization and behavior, although they don't actually play into deciding where an organism lands, taxonomically speaking. Behaviors don't matter for classifying organisms, unless we're talking about the morphology, that the function that relates to the form, right? So I included this because it's nice to think of, but it, it doesn't actually have to do with why anthropoids are different from um, non-anthropoid primates, right? So if you're an anthropoid primate and you have all of those traits, you can either be a catarine or you can be a platyrine. And it's all related to primarily, at least within the naming, the way that your nostrils are oriented. So these catarines down at the bottom have nostrils that open to the bottom like we do. But platyrines have nostrils that open to the side. Critically, another difference between catarines and platyrines are catarines have a dental formula that is two, one, two, three. So I have a bunch of skulls over here to the side. This is the jaw of a siamang. This is the jaw of a rhesus macaque. And this is the jaw of a chimp, right? All of these have the dental formula two, one, two, three, right? They have two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. And if I pull out, which I'm going to in just a second, and we'll, we'll work more with these, we'll work more with these skulls in a moment. But if you look at the human skull, it also has a two, one, two, three dental formula. So again, whether we're including humans or not, we can still, like, if you take humans out of it, this organization doesn't change, which really seriously damages Ramat's hypothesis that this was all changed to lump humans in a specific order, in a specific place, and make us animals so we can all sin and do gay stuff. It's like, no, that's not how any of this works. If humans are removed from the formula, it works exactly the same way. But 
Catarines also lack prehensile tails. Even the ones that have tails, like baboons, um, or ones that lack tails altogether, like macaques, none of them have prehensile tails, or tails that can actually grab and act like an extra limb. So if you're a catarine primate, like a macaque or a chimp, you have all of these traits, in addition to all of the anthropoid traits, in addition to all of the haplorine traits, in addition to all of the primate traits, in addition to the traits that make you a mammal, or a vertebrate, or an animal, or a eukaryote. We're talking about sweets here. Again, this is what you're going to see raw mat mess up. But you can take it a step further than being a catarine because hominoids, which are again a super family, I like hominoidia better than hominids because they actually include the gibbons, like I said. But hominoids also have, excluding them from the rest of the catarines or the cercopithecids, the old world monkeys, they have this increased shoulder mobility. It's not just a, a shoulder oriented to the back, but it's it's got a very specific mobile pattern to it. We also have unique Y-shaped molar patterns on our third molar, and we have more reduced caudal vertebra. We have the increased ability towards bipedality. Every single member of hominoidia can be bipedal. This isn't the same, the same is not to be said for every member of the old world monkeys, at least not with regard to efficiency or duration. We also have unique sinuses. We have this fusion of the frontal bone, post-orbital constriction. All of these traits separate us from the other old world monkeys. So while we and all of the old world monkeys, the hominoids and all of the old world monkeys share all of these traits that unite us under Catarini, we lack many of the traits that separate them from us into Cercopithecoid, or sorry, Cercopithecidae versus Hominoidia, right? But we have these traits within our superfamily that separate us from them, but unite us as a group. And Hominidae, which is the family level, is additionally separated in very specific, like, um, suites of, of minor skeletal characteristics. But we also have long child care periods, long gestations, and we have uh, physiological um, characteristics that, that, you, or that um, relate to that. We have a more ventral foramen and magnum, we have tool use and protoculture, and when then, of course, I've included in this slide the addition of genetics. But the important thing is, is we can do raw mats specifically accepted version of classification and humans still end up in this group. Whether or not we include them, this is how the categorization of primates hashes out. And when we do include humans in the kingdom of Animalia, this is where they land. Because they have all of the traits that land them in Animalia, in um, the, the Chordata, they have all of the traits that land them within Mammalia, within primates, within catarines, within hominoids, and within hominids. So this is how taxonomy, this is how classification works. We can do the same thing with genetics. Phylogeny incorporates this traditional version, but it also adds genetics into the picture. And when we include genetics, humans land just in the same place, right? That's just the way this works. So now that we're done with this, I'm going to pull big mode. So let's take for a moment the concept that we just explored in kind of the macroscopic picture, and let's look at it just in the context of something that is very, very easy to utilize when categorizing mammals or identifying them um, in isolation, and that's teeth. Dentition is really, really, really varied among mammals, unlike in homodont um, clades like reptiles uh, or, or birds or fish. So I have a couple of skulls here, as you know, and I want, or didn't, I guess not all skulls, I have some samples over here that I want you to appreciate. We have here a boar jaw, right? So this is the jaw of a boar, and its dental formula is three incisors, one canine, and you can't see it here because I think this is a, a younger specimen, but normally they have four premolars and three molars. Now, these guys are less related to humans by a small margin than, than canids are, but we have a canid skull right here, and we can do the same thing with this guy, right? This is a coyote skull. And this coyote has three premolars, one canine, two, or sorry, three incisors, one canine, two premolars, and four molars, I believe. So these guys, there's some variation, and like really and truly, they're, they're both Laurasiatherians, so they're both going to be approximately the same distance from humans. But their dentition is varied, 
and doesn't really unite them together, and it doesn't unite either with humans or with primates either. However, we can look at some of our other specimens here and see how it hashes out. So here's our Siamang, if I can grab him, her. It's actually it's explicitly a female Siamang, if you can see that. Um, does it say it's actually female on here? It is a female Siamang, but. So this is a female Siamang, right? Let's look at her dentition. She has two incisors, she has one canine, she has two premolars, and she has three molars. Not only that, but on the bottom jaw, you can see that she has a Y-shaped molar pattern on the back, if I can get it to focus. Hello? Focus, please. Please. It will eventually, right? Will it? Well, you might have to take my word for it, but Siamangs have Y-shaped molar patterns. Compare that to a rhesus macaque, which has the same exact dentition as the Siamang does, right? It's got the two incisors, a single canine, two premolars, and three molars, but it's got these bilophodont teeth, right? Bilophodont is a specific type of, of molar pattern. They're bunodont like we are, but they've got these special bilophodont teeth where the cusps are almost like in parallel. Like you've got like this quadrate tooth going on back here, quadrate-esque tooth going on here. So the dental formula unites these two organisms, right? These guys have the exact same dental formula. This is this one being the, um, the rhesus macaque, sorry, this one being the siamang, this one being the rhesus macaque. But even though their dental formula unites them, they're separated by the specific morphology of each individual tooth. This is why suites of characteristics have to be utilized. So now, if we were to find this chimpanzee, right, and we were wondering, morphologically speaking, now remember, all of these guys are primates, so they all have the same types of bones, they all have, uh, of course, there are variations in the shape, the size and shape of the bones, but oh, they have all of the same bones, generally speaking. So if we were to find this chimpanzee, and just based off of the dentition, we were trying to decide, a la classic Linnaean taxonomy, who he's most closely related to, we would look at the dentition and we would see that he has two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. And then we would say to ourselves, well, let's look at the molars specifically. Are they bilophodont or do they have a Y-shaped cusp pattern? You would look and you would see that it's got a Y-shaped cusp pattern. That means it has five cusps on the back molar. And if you could feel this, you would see that it has five cusps. So now let's say we find a human skull. And in our human skull here, we can see that the dental formula is, of course, two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. Two, one, two, three. Then we would look at the molar in the back, right? I've disarticulated it. But you would put your finger on it, and you would feel, if I can even find it over here, there we go. You would feel that it has five cusps and a Y-shaped molar pattern. So let's move back to our friend raw mat with in mind how taxonomy phylogenetics classification how all of this stuff works and why humans have landed where they are and let's appreciate it in the context of what raw mat has done here in the background i've got here a, a better side-by-side -side comparison so that you can really see the difference and and see kind of what i was talking about here the bilophodont teeth over on the i think that's a baboon but it might be a macaque it's circopithecid so same kind of teeth uh, versus the y5 pattern that we see on chimps gibbons orangs gorillas humans and um, and uh, bonobos so let's continue with raw mat shall we uh, he goes, well, let's actually look at these things in detail and investigate if that's true, shall we? In reference to the Y5 molar pattern, the rotating shoulder, the lack of a tail, the posteriorly posi uh, positioned scapula, and the fused caudal vertebra, as well as a large and complex brain. He goes, our jaw is parabolic in shape. Not a single primate's is. So already you can see how just out of five similarities, I have already foot one has already fallen when scrutinized just a little. So of the five similarities that he just listed, the, the parabolic palate wasn't listed as one, right? We have the Y5 pattern, the rotating shoulder, the lack of a tail, the posteriorly positioned scapula, the fused caudal vertebra, and it turns out there were actually six, a large brain. But out of those six characteristics listed, the parabolic palate wasn't listed as one because the parabolic palate is listed as a trait that separates hominins 
from hominids. So if we go back to our, our um, PowerPoint here, this would be the next level, right? Here, we're talking about hominids, but one of the traits that separates hominins, or this level right over here in between uh, hominini and homo, would be the parabolic palette. And in fact, we can see, we'll, be, we'll get to you in a moment, the evolution of the parabolic palette. We can see the evolution of this palette from a common ancestor down here, from a common ancestor with humans and chimps being something along the lines of Sahelanthropus chinensis, but down here they start with Australopithecus afarensis because the palate shape is one of the later things to change, hence a hominin trait. We can see the evolution of it growing more and more parabolic as we make our way over to Homo, as we make our way into Homo habilis, etc. I believe I actually have a really good uh, slide in here somewhere. One moment, we gotta make our way all the way to paleontology. Ape-like hominins, mosaic hominins, here we go. Yeah, so Australopithecus africanus, habilis, uh, there they go with Pithecanthropus, but that's also just Homo erectus through Hadalbergensis to Neanderthals and to humans. So parabolic palate isn't even a trait that unites or is claimed to unite like apes, <laughs> but, but it's interesting that he pulls it out because it's very difficult. You can't actually debunk any of those uniting traits. So he goes, one has fallen when scrutinized a little. That's just wrong. It wasn't even used in the first place. Next, can we rotate our shoulders? Sure, obviously. The matter of fact is that the human shoulder blades are actually unique to humans, having a combination of better lateral orientation and scapular blade shape. Yes, this is true, except all of the apes aren't united by the traits that distinguish the human shoulder blade from the other apes. They're distinguished by having a, a shoulder blade oriented to the back that's highly mobile. Mobile has actually been... Um, been quantified to a specific range of motion. You can put a number to that, and that range unites all of the hominoids. But even with that in mind, let's consider the shoulder blades in and of themselves. This is from a paper, oh gosh, who is it by? Who is it by? Fossil hominins, shoulder support, an African ape-like last common ancestor of humans and chimps. And this is a paper by Young et al. from 2015. So here's a plot of several different shoulder blades and their, their morphometrics, right? So the, the, the quantification of their size and shape. Hilo batids are over here, followed by pongids or the, um, the orangutans. Then we have panins, or sorry, pongins. Then we have panins, gorillans, and homo sapiens. Below, we can see, in addition to that, we also have access to our fossil, our fossil hominin shoulder or scapula um, scapular measurements. We have Australopithecus afarensis, which appears to map in between panins or chimpanzees and Homo sapiens. We have Australopithecus sediba, which, which maps about the same way. Aragaster, which is a little bit closer to Homo sapiens, but still intermediate. Neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens archaic. Even archaic Homo sapiens is unique from anatomically modern Homo sapiens. But what you'll notice is that out of all of these hominoids, Humans aren't the only odd man out, right? Humans have shoulder blades that are unique to humans, but gorillas have shoulder blades unique to gorillas, panins unique to panins, uh, pongins unique to pongins, and hylobatids uh, unique to hylobatids. So him pointing out that humans have a unique shoulder blade is completely inconsequential to the fact that the unique aspects of the human shoulder blade do not erase the unifying size or the unifying characteristics in the range that makes up apes. Humans map with the apes, not with other primates. So you can see here, we've got a couple of different, uh-oh, ooh, can I go back? There it is. We have a couple of different shoulder blades being mapped, and what you'll notice is that the shoulder blades are in direct relation to locomotion pattern, right? Humans are here, along with other members of genus Homo, then Australopithecus sediba, then Australopithecus afarensis, and then all the way over here, we have bonobos and chimps. Now, gorillas and panins are pretty closely related in, in relation to the morphometrics of their scapula, but we have the hylobatids all by themselves over here. Orangutans are more closely related to humans on the x-axis, but humans are more closely related to uh, bonobos and chimps and gorillas on the y-axis. The point is that, yes, human shoulder blades are unique within the broad range that lumps them with the rest of the apes, as are gorillas, as are panins, etc. So that is, um, 
I mean, I don't know why I'm over explaining this. He's not going to care. He, he doesn't care about what is what is actually factual, but just what makes it very ironic that he's very much like, do your own research in this thing. He goes, so now two out of the five things show we are vastly different when we investigate them rather than just overall glaze over them. But let's go on. Is our brain larger than other animals like it is in apes? Yes, but our brain is actually much larger than any apes, seven times larger. Human, the human brain size is not seven times larger. The, the cc's for human brains are about 1,200, and for chimps it's about 300 to 400. So that's more like four times the size, not seven times. But I don't expect him. See, oh, okay, I see, because he goes on weight. So he's talking about weight and not actually brain size. But you know, good, um, good scholarship would be to specify that with multiple different neurons not found in any other primates. For example, humans have rosehip neurons in the brain. No apes have this. So rosehip neurons, I believe, are actually a pretty recent, pretty recent work. Um, I have them up here. So I googled, do chimps have rosehip neurons? It is still possible that these newly identified neurons will also be found in the brains of primates like monkeys or chimps, Lyon says. And the reason is because in the original study, they were comparing it to mice. So we know mice don't have rosehip neurons, but you know what else mice don't have? Any of these traits that we went over at the beginning, which is why they aren't primates, why they aren't haplorines, why they aren't simiaforms or anthropoids, why they aren't catarines, why they aren't hominoids, and why they aren't hominids. So he's he's kind of just making shit up here right saying that they don't have rosehip neurons okay it hasn't actually been investigated to my knowledge so then he goes not to mention orphan genes are highly expressed in the human brain but not in primates whatsoever let me read let me say that one more time for you not in primates whatsoever not in primates whatsoever this is from a paper titled Origins of de novo genes in humans and chimpanzees, and in the introduction, second paragraph, we discuss orphan genes. Species or lineage-specific genes, which are often called orphan genes, have been described in a wide range of organisms, including yeast, primates, rodents, insects, and plants. So, I don't know where he's going here. I guess he's talking about orphan genes being highly expressed in the human brain, but not in primates, except even though they are in all of these organisms, they are also highly expressed in chimpanzee brains, hence the subject of this paper. I could go down the list of differences between us and apes, and the list would put you to sleep. But they put blinders on and only focus on the basic physical feature similarities so that they can swindle the public and kids with wordplay. It's, it's not wordplay. It's, it's suites of characteristics right? Again, you can just do this yourself, Ramat. Take humans out of it. Pretend that humans are their own unique lineage, and you go out and categorize all of the organisms by their physical characteristics or their genetics, right? Which is, again, the only way you can do this empirically. If you want to include behaviors, you're not really doing, like, you're not really doing the empiricism, okay? Because there's so much subjectivity to all of that. So go out and do that. Then try to fit humans into a spot and see if once you've gathered up all of the different characteristics that unite all of these different organisms into their respective categories like Carl Linnaeus did, see if you can find a spot where humans fit. It's going to be with the hominids, okay? Like, that's, that's what happened with Linnaeus. Okay, so, okay, we're going to go into this next category, but I'm going to need some more tea. So next up, Ramad goes into, like, it's just a semantic argument, and it's also wrong, which, which is kind of funny. He goes, <clears throat> first of all, apes are not a clade. Ape is an English word. It is not a taxonomic term. English words do not need to be monophyletic. French, German, Russian, and other languages do not have to accord with English ways of splitting up animals. Taxono eh, taxonomy is international everywhere. We recognize that humans are hominoids. In French, apes are singes. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. My French friends are going to kill me. And so are monkeys. In English, we differentiate these two terms. But in both languages, humans are different from other primates. Does that mean French is right and English is wrong? Does it mean both languages are wrong? No, it means that colloquial languages have no problem describing paraphyletic groups. It's useful to have languages that can make these distinctions. So if we must accept that humans are apes, then we must equally accept that chimpanzees are monkeys and ignorant people who call monkeys apes are actually right. Yes, that is true. I don't. I see value in portraying truth and precision about phylogeny, and for that purpose I have taxonomic terms. People are eukaryotic mammal humans, known as mankind, not apes. 
A child can tell the difference, but adult biologists who believe that evolution cannot. This is the twilight zone world we live in today, where common sense is left at the door for the next science fact the teacher throws at kids. This is this is just gibberish for the most part. But it is useful to note that yes, humans are technically monkeys. We are haplorine monkeys. We are caterine monkeys. Um, so mm, mm, this is good to know. We're anthropoid monkeys too. I mean, the, we do fall into the same category as many other monkeys in the same sense that we are mammals. So <clears throat> while he is correct that there is colloquial difference in, in everyday language, um, he is wrong on whether or not that language is correct. It isn't correct, right? Um, it, it, this is something that kills me too. He goes, first of all, apes aren't a clade. That's just wrong. Apes are a clade. There's hominoidea, which is a clade, and there's hominidae, which is a clade. And both of them effectively refer to great apes plus gibbons and great apes, including humans, which are great apes. We are a member of great apes. Um, <laughs> it's like saying, this is like saying dogs isn't, an, isn't a taxonomic term, right? Like, no, it isn't. But Canidae is, and dogs are members of Canidae. Apes are members of hominidae and hominoidea, right? Um, <laughs> it's just the colloquial usage of hominoidea or hominidae in the same way that dogs is the colloquial usage of canidae. We usually tend to refer to canids, most canids, as dogs, the dog group. So, and the rest of this is, it, it's just really dumb. I don't really care. I don't care about what the, what other languages differentiate and which ones don't. Uh, it is completely inconsequential to the the way that we actually categorize animals via empirical data. Evolutionary scientists shouldn't smuggle taxonomic principles into everyday language to make a political argument. That's what humans are apes ultimately is. It's an argument that we aren't as great as we actually are. It's an attempt to make us nothing more than another animal in their naturalist religion. Cladistic terminology is controlled by taxonomists, people who often shift ideas, people who often shift ideas as much as public this, this is just another like poorly constructed. People who often shift ideas as much as public opinion does. I guess what he meant to say is people often shift ideas as much as public opinion does, but that's just like not what he wrote. Also, it, this is completely tangential to anything that we were really actually talking about, like the, the colloquial language. At the same time, humans are apes because like in the same way that chimps are apes they're both hominids and hominoids in the same way that a dog is a canid right um I, I just i don't think that this is at all worth talking about although i do think it's really funny that he's got this um <laughs> this cartoon of obama like handing over a sack of money to like a greedy scientist and the the, the sack of money says evolutionary research funds and then the guy says, sure, I'll settle that science for you. And he's got like the 95%. Uh, it's just like a Ben Garrison cartoon, pretty much. Um, I don't know what this was originally supposed to be. I guess it was originally supposed to be about climate change because it's pretty clear that he like photoshopped his own stuff on there. Since evolutionists now use taxonomic terms to swindle the public calling humans apes, let's break this down and see if it holds weight logically. Are you, You're in for a trait. Are you ready? If you were at a zoo and your child with your child looking at a chimpanzee and they said look at the monkey mommy the mom would say that's not a monkey honey that's an ape so if you jumped the fence and stood next to the chimp and the kid said look at that ape mommy would the parent not say oh honey that's a human or would she say yes honey the hairless ape sure looks the same doesn't he obviously you would correct your child and explain why we are human and not an ape nor a monkey this is just so stupid I can barely keep my breakfast down I I imagine <laughs> it would be like if we just swapped the animals out right and the little kid was like you know they're looking at like a lion or something right and the little kid's like look at the cat mommy and um and then the mom's like that's not a cat that's a lion it's both right it's both and then they were like oh no it's not actually a lion it's a Barbary lion, right? It's like, it, this is about further specification. A human is a monkey and it's an ape and it's a human. A chimp is a monkey and it's an ape and it's a chimp. It's not a human, nor is a human a chimp, right? They share a lot, but they don't share everything. 
course, they do share more than a, than a lion and a tiger share. But th this is just, I mean, it's a stupid argument, but it's not even consistent within itself. I'm promoting the idea we use taxonomy for its intended purpose and not insist that English do the job instead. We aren't apes, and it's okay to teach our children that chimpanzees and gorillas are apes, not monkeys, because that's what real and honest, that's what's real and honest and true. Humans are part of mankind, not ape kind, and the originator of taxonomy knew this. All of that is wrong. Every single sentence in that was actually just incorrect. Not a single right word in that paragraph. The classifications of humans uh, as great apes is also dependent on a historical contingency. Remember, we have no extant sister taxa. In the not-so-distant past, humans shared this planet with several other races of humans that are now gone. They weren't races, they were species. But we now know them today as Neanderthal and Dinsovan. This means that from... This means that from what we know about genetics and our history going back in time, over 100% of our species' existence, we shared the Earth with only other humans. No other proof of missing link DNA inside us exists. What about the 98% of DNA we share with chimps, right? We share 98% of 98.8% of DNA with chimps, and so do Neanderthals, Matt. So do Denisovans. They also share all of that DNA. So you could use your same, oh, it's just similar design argument over with Neanderthals too. Humans and Neanderthals aren't related, Matt. It's just similar design. That's so stupid. It wears the line. You have to provide something empirical here. Um, you are correct. For the vast majority of the, of the existence of Homo sapiens, we have existed alongside other hominins. But it also wasn't just Neanderthals and Denisovans. It was also Homo floresiensis and Homo heidelbergensis and Homo naledi and Homo luzinensis and perhaps some other more archaic hominins as well. So mm, mm, you're not helping your case with this one. If one or more of these other humans had survived into contempt, sorry, if one of, I'm going to correct this for him. If one or more of these other hominins had survived in contemporary times, our taxonomic classification scheme for, for humans would probably look much different. Instead of focusing on the similarities between humans and chimpanzees or humans and gorillas, we would likely shift our attention to focusing on the similarities and differences between apes and man and similarities between other humans that evolution thinks were primitive in our own family tree. So his argument here is that we only look at how similar we are to chimps because they're the closest thing to us today. And that if Neanderthals existed, we would focus on them as the closest thing to us today. Yes, that's true. You aren't helping your case here, right? Like you have to show why chimps don't fall into that same category simply because they're more distant than Neanderthals. If it wasn't chimps, if we were the only apes still alive, we would be focusing on like rhesus macaques instead. Why doesn't that work? You, you, you have to provide a reason, which you have not done. <laughs> you tried it once with barcoding. Remember how embarrassing that was? Okay. But yes, we are more closely related to humans. Uh, we are more closely related to other hominins like Neanderthals and Denisovans. It is nonsense for taxonomists to lump us humans in with the great apes. Ex Oh god. The differences are far too striking, yet they do it all the time. This is why they choose simplistic, vague similarities and call us apes and force us into the category. You can also see their lies anytime a supposed new missing link... Sh I, okay. You can also see their lies anytime you see a supposed missing link. That was on me, not Raman. Why do they immediately name it? Something that starts with homo, right? Well, have you ever been asked why that is? Because homo is Latin for man? Is he not aware of all of the other hominins that have been discovered in the more distant past that have been named literally other things, right? Like, like Australopithecus sediva, for instance, the one that's like right there in your face. How about, well, let's go further back. What about Oreopithecus bamboli, am I a scene ape that may have been bipedal? Because he doesn't know how this works, right? He doesn't know how this works. But of course, he doesn't know what a half-life is either, so expecting him to be able to coordinate morphologic change in geologic time is definitely above his pay grade. So they are immediately classing some new discovery and placing it into the human family tree before the evidence is even in. How is that for honest science? 
The implications for splitting humans from great apes taxonomically would be beneficial even to evolutionists, but they are too ignorant to see it because they are too busy pushing their fable. Conceptually, it would allow researchers to better understand their own model for ape-human divergence and the key differences between humans and great apes today, but perhaps more importantly, splitting humans from the great apes allows, allows us to re reconceptualize our own humanity. It would force the secular camp to acknowledge how different we really are. They would be forced to see the differences, not just the few similarities. Do not be fooled by political lies with motives behind it intended to push nonsense. It's just another way evolutionists lie and manipulate. Any child would automatically relate us any child would automatically relate us to an ape with this wording. Because they would be right, right? Like again, this is why it would be really interesting if Ramat tried to come up with his own taxonomy here. Um, he has attempted it before and he's failed miserably every single time within the own sources that he showed on the screen. <laughs> like it's, it's actually incredible. Um, but in addition to that, like, this is also kind of nonsensical. Like he's like, oh, you know, s secular scientists should consider the things that separate humans and the other great apes. We do. There are things that separate us from the other great apes. That's why we're not a chimp or a gorilla or an orangutan, right? We're humans, we're our own species within the great apes, but chimps have things that separate them from the gorillas and the orangutans and us too, as do gorillas from the rest of the apes, as do orangutans. This is why we all get our own species. And there are also key separations between us and Neanderthals and us and Denisovans as well. That's why we're all different species. So, you know, I, it, we're doing the thing that he says He's like, oh, th this is what they should do. Yeah, I know, we're already doing it. And then he's like, if they did that, they would actually see how different humans and great apes are. Except we are doing it, and we're not all that different. We are different, but we're not all that different. Less different than many other animals that we would consider to be more similar. Again, like African and Asian elephants, rats and mice, or lions and tigers. You see, we can do anything with words. We can label anything we want. Look, people are doing it with sexual preference today. Okay, Ramat. We could just as easily say we are more related to raccoons than anything else. Therefore, we should taxonomically be called Procyonidae. Would this hold weight? Sure, we can easily find five similarities with them, as was the justification to call man an ape. There's your thesis statement for why Ramat doesn't understand this. He thinks it's five arbitrary similarities rather than complete levels of taxonomic categorizations, each level containing a massive amount, a massive suite of characteristics that you have to have in order to be accepted into that given classification in that hierarchical level, right? You have to have all these traits to be considered primate. If you are primate, you might be a haplorine or you might be a strepsorine. To be a haplorine, you have to have all these different criteria. If you have all those criteria, you are indeed a primate and you are indeed a haplorine, but are you an anthropoid? I don't know. Do you have this suite of characteristics? If you are, you might be an anthropoid. Same thing with catarine and platyrine, all the way down the list, ending us with hominidae and eventually with homo. This is what he doesn't understand. Right? It, I don't know how Romat thinks this works, but he clearly doesn't know how it actually does. Not even within like the old school Linnaean way, right? It, he, and we're going to get, oh, that's going to get worse in a second. Evolutionists are always trying to strengthen their arguments to make evolution sound true because they have no actual evidence to prove their made-up deep time phylogenetic traits are real. One such way to do this is by combining different branches of science. It's called consilience. For example, combining nucleotide variations between species, taxonomy, and physical similarities, aka homology. But it's just a ridiculous attempt to find why it uh, it's just a ridiculous attempt and why it's failing so hard for them. But it's just a ridiculous attempt and why it's failing so hard for them. That's nonsensical. It's 50-50, right? Whether it's me reading too fast and tripping over words or like Ramat just couldn't compose a sentence, right? It, it, you should never read a book where, it's, where that even makes up 1%, right? Bad sentence composition. These tree branches change all the time because inevitably if a biologist, if a biologist by using comparative anatomy puts something on one branch, it won't take long before a taxonomist moves it to another. It just shows the inadequacy of this entire program. That's just not true though like i just showed that because we don't use single traits we use suites of characteristics 
The big brain thing is a great, great example of this, right? If something has a big brain, it's a primate. Therefore, dolphins are primates. Therefore, proboscideans are primates. Except having a big brain isn't the only thing you need to be a primate. You have to have a gigantic suite of characteristics in order to fall into that category. Now that is just using three things. Imagine if all the different fields of science had their input into helping build these trees. What a disaster that would be. Let me give you an example of how much more of a mess it would be to build these trees and branches just using a single animal. Let's take a skunk and a human, shall we? I guess so. <laughs> We have similar, so similar solitary lives until we find a mate, as do skunks, so scientists would toss us into a related tree branch on a phylogenetic tree. No, that's not how this works. One, that's a behavior. Two, you would never use a single trait to group something, two organisms into the same order. That, would, that has never happened and would never happen because as Ramat thinks he understands it, it would be inadequate. It would be. But he's building a straw man here because that's not actually how it works. But again, we don't use behavior anyway, so. But then a geneticist comes along and notices we are not related to skunks at all. Their chromosome count is 50 and humans are 46, so they get pushed back off the branch. And so what he's doing is he's showing series of branches and showing how uh, using different categorization, single traits, we can move them on the same branch or separate them into different branches. I, I want you to appreciate how the first type of scientist, the one that grouped them based off of solitary lives, that type of scientist was just called scientists. And then the second type of scientist is geneticists. Those are the two genders, scientists and geneticists. <laughs> it's just, it's the same thing as apes and humans or dogs and dogs and canids, right? Like <laughs> geneticists are scientists, humans are apes, dogs are canids. It's, uh, oh God, we're coming full circle. Um, also, Having different chromosome numbers doesn't mean you're not related at all. This is, again, another fundamental problem that Ramat has with understanding how any of this kind of thing works, right? Like how, how relatedness works. This would be like saying, looking at a highly variable position on the genome and taking you and your great, 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 great uncle, right? And saying these two aren't related at all because they don't have any similarities on this highly variable section of the genome. This is how a lot of common or a lot of uh, 23andMe stuff works, right? It's how you tell relationships. Obviously, you're still related to that great, 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 great uncle, right? You're just less related to that particular relative than you would be to your great uncle. That's how this works, right? You're still related to a skunk. You're both mammals and um, actually, I think that's as far as it goes. You're in different orders, but you are in the same class. So you're both mammals, you're both eukaryotes, you're both animals, right? Okay, then comes along an anatomist who notices that skunks have body hair and so do humans, so they add us back to the branch. Nope. <laughs> Again, that's not how that works. Um, an anatomist, first of all, I don't think an anatomist would be doing that job, right? Second of all, what would actually happen is that you would have someone come along and say, well, I noticed that humans have 46 chromosomes and skunks have 50 and they both have body hair, so they're probably kind of related, but not as related as something that has the same number of chromosomes as a skunk, right? Then comes a taxonomist who removes the skunk again from the tree branch because we're not in the order carnivora. We humans are not. Okay, th this is the sentence that he just said. Then comes a taxonomist who removes the skunk again from the tree branch because we are not in the order carnivora. We humans are not. That's just, that's what he wrote. So how do you think, Ramat, that the order carnivora is defined? That's a great question to ask. What, how is the order carnivora defined? I'll give you a hint. It's by a suite of characteristics, all of which can play into what organisms belong there in relation to all of these different scientists that he's presenting. Then along comes a zoologist who notices they have anal scent glands, which they can use as a defensive weapons, but humans do not have so, or, but humans have no such thing, so they remove them from our tree branch again. The anal scent glands would be a part of deciding what the order, card, what the order carnivora includes, right? So would the one I just skipped, which is an ethologist who notices they are active year round and so are humans, so they add them back to the tree branch, except no. That wouldn't because that's a behavior and not a physical characteristic or genetic one. Um, 
Then comes along a statistician who notices they're found in most states just like people, so they get moved back onto the tree branch. That is not, like, range is not a part of deciding where you fall on the hierarchical tree. That's like saying you and your grandpa live in different states, so you can't be related. That's so unbelievably stupid. I can't even handle it. Then a kinesiologist notices our body movements are not similar, so they remove the skunk from the tree branch. It wouldn't be a kinesiologist, it would be someone specializing in biomechanics, and biomechanics is related to skeletal structure and morphology, which is part of what goes into deciding what orders, the criteria for each order, right? Their morphology. Then along comes a homologist who notices they all look the same, just like newborn babies, moving them back onto the tree branch. Then comes a homologist who notices that they all look the same, just like newborn babies. I have no idea what that's even trying to say. Then comes a pathologist who notices skunks can carry infectious diseases like rabies, but humans do not, so they are removed again from the tree branch. Humans humans do carry rabies, raw mat. They do. It's got a 99% um, mortality rate. It's a, you don't want to get rabies. I've had rabies shots because I've been in areas with like where rabies is common. Then along comes a mammologist and says, well, skunks are mammals and so are humans and puts them into the same branch again. Then a linguist notices skunks only have basic communication skills and can never produce language. They're removed from the tree branch again. Then comes an anthrozoologist who notices they don't go into hibernation just like humans, so they get added back onto the tree branch. See the results? Nonsense to its core. Oh my God. You promote Linnaean taxonomy. You did this at the beginning of the section. Like, this is so manic. This is just absolute gibberish, this section. But also, none of what you just listed is at all anything but... It's like the ravings of a madman. You cannot use any of those criteria, but none of that can be standardized, right? You are actually failing to understand the very concept that you're trying to debunk. The, cr the way that this works is that at different levels of the hierarchical classification system, whether you're using phylogeny or whether you're doing classic Linnaean taxonomy, is you have suites of criteria that an organism has to have in order to fall into that category. Mammals, you, a reptile like, uh, like, a, like a crocodile can never be a mammal because it doesn't have mammary glands, right? It doesn't have a dentary squamosal joint. It doesn't have many different traits that mammals all share, but crocodiles lack. It's never just one thing. It's never just one thing, unless it's something super, super basic, like eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. And even that, it's like, there's still differences like that, that go beyond the presence of a nucleus, right? It's never just one thing, which is why this is such an exercise in inanity. But this is what I just told you. He has no idea what he's talking about. Okay, the more they investigate, the more phylogeny breaks down. This is why the two current college books that exist today that teach evolution, Tree Thinking and Evolution 101, have failed miserably at this. Of the 49 trees of life drawn in Evolution 101, not a single tree includes the name of a common ancestor. I can't even tackle that before I read the next paragraph. Let alone even begin to explain how the first male and female had to arise at the same time. Their explanatory power comes from it comes in the form of storytelling. Our model is far superior, and the more we investigate the small things, the more profound this becomes. Just look at the vast physiological differences between us and primates. We're going to cover that in just a second. First, it is very telling that he's using the how do you get the male and female being born in the right place in the right time in order for a new species to emerge. It wasn't like one day a chimp-like animal gave birth to a human right? This is slow change over time, it, like over the geologic scale. Even when you're looking at something like punctuated equilibrium, where you've got periods of more stasis-like development followed by, you know, massive growth as niches open up and allow animals to adapt to them. It's not a fast process, right? And every, it, it's like the concept of ring species, right? You're never going to have an organism, really, that's going to be born that is going to be entirely reproductively isolated from the population it came from. Populations evolve, not organisms, Raman, not individuals. As for the, I, I mean, it was pretty 
I just don't care about the other stuff that he said. Like, of the 49 trees of life drawn in Evolution 101, not a single tree includes the name of a common ancestor. I just don't, I don't think that's true. But even if it is, I am assuming Ramat wants every common ancestor all the way back to, like, Luca. Um, which, of course not. We don't know what Luca is or what it looked like. Why would we give it nomenclature? Denisovans doesn't even have nomenclature, and we have that thing's genome. Right? You have to have a holotype. Okay, if we're talking fossils anyways. Okay, now we get to talk about the differences between humans and primates, just as if we would talk about the difference between dogs and carnivorous. <laughs> Can we talk to each other? Yes. Can we play music? Yes. Apes do not care for the elderly or sick. They have no medicine, use no fire, no storage of food, no language acquisition. Couple of things here. Do we talk, do humans talk to each other? Yes, we vocalize at each other. So does almost every other mammal on the planet. Chimpanzees have the gestural repertoire. First of all, they communicate primarily by gestures. Most great apes do, um, other than humans, of course, and other than gibbons, halibatids. They tend to have complex duet songs that they do. Chimpanzees have the gestural repertoire of a two-year-old toddler, and no one taught either this gestural repertoire, right? This is, like, it, apparently it is an innate way of communication. They have the same give-me sign, they have the same, fit, mon, much of the same um, uh, facial expressions as well. Um, in fact, they share, I, I believe it's over 90%. Let me see. Okay, so I got it pulled up here. It's actually 89%, so it was pretty close, but not quite. We recorded n equals 13, so 13 individual children's gestures in a natural setting with peers and caregivers in Germany and Uganda. Children employed 52 distinct gestures, 46 of which are present in the chimpanzee repertoire. Like chimps, they both used, they, they used them both singly and in sequence and employed individual gestures flexibly towards different goals. So lots of different... <laughs> <laughs> Lots of similarities there between uh, between chimps and toddlers. Okay, as for playing music, well, well we're still doing uh, talking to one another. So yes, it, chimpanzees talk if we're using talking as a substitute for uh, conveying information through either vocal or gestural means. This is just communication. Uh, if he's speaking about, like, the complexities of the human language, the human language is really complex. That's one of the things that is generally considered to be unique to humanity. Can we play music? Yes, that is almost certainly a stem off of something like language, but more importantly, um, as far as music in general, gorillas hum little tunes to themselves while they're actually eating. Um, I think this is pretty cool. Hold on. Uh, gorillas humming while eating. Boom. Gorillas sometimes hum while they eat. Gorillas sing happy songs while they eat. Gorillas compose happy songs that they hum during meals. Gorillas hum and sing while they eat, says to, in order to say do not disturb. Is this music? I don't know. What is music? <laughs> the problem is that it's oftentimes a gradient, is it not? So that's can apes play music. Then we have apes do not care for the elderly and sick. They have no medicine. How about that? What can we what can, what can we find in the literature on that? Well, this was the first thing that I managed to dig up. You could also read the entirety of Franz de Waal's direct observations and books, uh, in which he discusses altruism and uh, cooperation in panins, specifically bonobos, um, and I think Western chimps. But this is a great paper from 2018. Chimpanzee cooperation is fast and independent from self-control. These results show that humans and chimpanzees share cognitive processes for cooperation despite differences in the scope of their cooperative behaviors. So yet again, what we're seeing is we're seeing a gradient, not a lack of something in chimps in the presence of it in humans. They found that chimpanzees were faster to make pro-social decisions than selfish choices and that more pro-social individuals made the fastest responses. Further, two measures of self-control did not predict variation in pro-social responding and an individual performance across cooperative tasks did not co-vary. So what about, um, oh boy, what about self-medicative behavior? So so on this one, we have self-medicative behavior in the African great apes, an evolutionary perspective into the origins of human traditional medicine. In addition to giving us a deeper understanding of our closest living relatives, the study of great ape self-medication provides a window into the origins of herbal medicine used by humans and promises to provide new insights into ways of treating parasitic infections and other serious diseases. 
This is from back in 2001, and the gist of it is that a bunch of different chimpanzee populations were examined, and they found that a whole lot of these populations of chimps were utilizing a, um, what would it be? It's like an anti-nausea drug. Uh, in the form of chewing these leaves that local human populations have been using as an herbal remedy for centuries and centuries and centuries. So a behavior seen in humans is recapitulated in chimps, and so they wondered, okay, well, maybe they're just doing it because they like it. But it turned out that the leaf swallowing was pretty limited to those who actually had a high parasitic load, meaning they have parasites, their stomachs are upset, and so they're consuming the leaves that they know ease that pain. Specific conversation about this is listed in this portion of the paper, impact of leaf swallowing on parasite load and the proposed mechanism of expulsion. Osophagostomum and um, Osophagostomum stephanostomum worms were only found in 4% of the 254 dung samples collected from individuals observed in detail. Their occurrence in the dung was limited to chimpanzees that displayed symptoms of malaise and diarrhea. In 1993 to 1994, six of the nine dung samples found to contain worms also contained the undigested leaves of uh, various species of, of local flora. The relationship between the presence of both leaves and nodular worms in dung was highly significant using a Fisher's exact test. So to me, this feels a little bit like self-medication. So I suppose that you have to cross that off the list, that they have no medicine. How about use of fire? Well, while chimpanzees aren't known to harness fire, that doesn't mean that they don't understand fire and how to utilize it. Kanzi Bonobo starts fire. So Kanzi the Bonobo was actually taught how to build a fire and roast marshmallows, a video that you can find here, which of course begs the question, well, okay, so what? So you can teach a Bonobo how to build a fire. But the problem is you can't learn about fire and really how to harness it unless you've been exposed to it before. It's very difficult to be exposed to fire or indeed to light a fire even by happenstance when everything is wet all the time. Where do chimps live? The rainforest. Where do bonobos live? The rainforest. Where do gorillas live? The rainforest. And where do orangutans live? The rainforest. So these guys have a lot going against them as far as fire use goes. But even if they weren't capable of using fire at all, I still don't think that this as a behavior is going to be enough to separate you from the rest of the chimps. After all, wolves aren't very good at obeying human commands even when they're taught. Does that mean that they're not canids? No. <laughs> and also dogs aren't very good at hunting buffalo. Behavior is, this is why behavior is a poor method by which to classify organisms. No storage of food, no language acquisition. They can absolutely acquire language, that's for sure, because we can teach them ASL, can't we? We can also teach them how to use lexigrams, like again, kanzi here. As for storage of food, I believe chimps are actually known to at least store small provisions of food, if memory serves. Uh, but I do know, let me double check here while I'm on that, because I'm actually not sure on that. But I do know that they actually store specific rocks for crushing specific types of nuts. Do chimpanzees store food? Let's see here. While they do not store meat, they do use it for social gain by sharing it. So sharing meat, that's not really what I'm looking for. Do chimps hoard food? They hog food. I don't know if they store it though. I'll have to look into that a little bit and let you know in our next break whether or not they've actually been observed storing food. Again though, it's a behavior. They can never learn abstract thought. That's insane. Chimpanzees are well understood to have what is at very least a very basal form of the theory of mind, which is the ability to abstractly think about the other's position, right? It's the ability to put yourself in another's shoes. Orangutans also appear to have a concept of time. They have no domestication abilities. Oh, I really hate to break this one to you, Ramat. Baboons domesticate dogs. Baboons kidnap and raise wild dogs as pets. Now, I don't know really what happened to this, but this was something that went around for a while back a couple years ago, where we were looking at various types of baboons in northern Africa, which were actually kidnapping local dogs um, in the area and raising them to be a part of their troop. The baboons groom and play with the dogs, showing that they accept them as family members since baboons only groom family members. The dogs protect the baboons from other wild dogs and guard them at night while they sleep. That sounds kind of like domestication behavior to me. 
Now, again, this is, we're, I'm, I'm throwing this out there because this is the first thing that came to mind. Like I said, I don't really script these, um, or at least in a few, few moments in advance if I have any sources that I like. Um, but again, this, <laughs> this is at the very least a very, very basal form of this type of behavior. Okay, what else do we have? What else do we have? No grandparenting. False. That's actually like grandparents are a massive, massive, massive role player in numerous different primate societies because they form what's called a matriline, right? This is mostly in bonobos um, and macaques, I believe. Lots of circopithecids. I don't think they do this in chimps as much. Role of grandmothers in chimps and bonobos. This is, the, this is literally the point of the grandmother hypothesis, known as the grandmother effect in this paper here, or at least it's discussed here. Women experience more years of vigorous life after ovulation has ceased than do females of other primate species. It is an, this is an epiphenomenon of greater life expectancy humans have enjoyed, or rather, is this the, an epiphenomenon of greater life expectancy humans have enjoyed over the past century, or is, it a, it, or is long postmenopausal survival the result of an evolutionary selection process? Recent research implies the latter. Long menopausal survival has come about through natural selection. One prominent line of thought explaining this selection process is through the grandmother hypothesis. I believe they did this with cetaceans as well, the role of grandmothers, but let me see here if we can find our, our chips. Oops, chimpanzee. Midlife menopause is a chimpanzee display this trait. Young female chimpanzees continue to cycle. So grandmothers play a role for certain in sociality in chimpanzees, but they don't actually fully undergo what's called the grandmother hypothesis, or at least the foundations of the grandmother hypothesis because it involves a menopause. Um, and specifically the, the decline of the grandmother rules fertility so that they can then uh, aid family and kin in the raising of their closely related um, relatives, close relatives, I should say. Chimpanzee experiences a period of extended postmenopausal infertility compared to women summarized. Let's see, I really wanna see if we have, yeah, I can look this, oh, let me see. I think they're just discussing menopause and chimps. I really want to see the rule. I know old females. What am I saying? Old female bonobos have a massive, massive, massive role. This is outlined in the text by Franz de Wall titled Mama's Last Hug, where he actually specifically goes over the political power that, <clears throat> excuse me, was wielded by the eldest chimpanzee in a chimp colony. Uh, this is really outlined in the first chapter, which is an ape matriarch's farewell. So grandmothering is indeed a role that is filled in many different primate societies. I don't know how much it is in chimps compared to bonobos and macaques, uh, but certainly in bonobos and macaques. All right, let's continue here, if you can even hear me. All right, grandparenting, no ability to even comprehend a movie or what a phone is, let alone figure out how to make one. I don't care about any of that. Technology is entirely irrelevant. We don't understand a lot of, for instance, the intricacies of termite farming that these guys do. Or we could even go so far as to say we don't understand the intricacies of hierarchical living in an ant colony. All right, they don't have to understand exactly how we live our lives in order to be cognitively on our great ant. Biologically, <laughs> We totally different as well. Not we're. Biologically, we totally different as well. The different kinds of muscle tissues primates have, a powerful jaw, there, spelled like the location there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, complete immunity to infection, dense, thick fur protecting them from the elements. We supposedly lost ours, now we have to wear fur again. And then we have to take off this fur clothing at bedtime to get under more fur blankets to stay warm. Makes perfect sense. Reality, human body hair is nothing like primate fur. Let's discuss this for a moment. First of all, humans and chimpanzees have all of the exact same muscle tissue types, um, at least to my knowledge. We have, we both have brown and white fat, although chimpanzees have different ratios of it because humans are adapted more to take advantage of our, I think it's a urocase breakage, um, but we're especially adept for fat storing because we're endurance runners. We're actually significantly more active than chimpanzees when living our, nat our natural lifestyle or evolved lifestyle as, as evidenced by modern hunter-gatherers. But our tissues, as far as muscle, twi muscle tissues in general, although again, there's a difference in fast to slow twitch muscle ratios, 
we still have all the same stuff, right? It's the same exact stuff in the same way that a wolf and a dog have the same types of muscle tissues and the same bones and the same organs. They just look a little bit different because they're adapted for different or they have different adaptations for different environments. Okay, powerful jaw. Let's talk about that next. Human jaws are actually about as strong as a chimpanzee's jaw. I was very, very surprised by this um, because I was actually, I read that and I was like, yeah, okay, so what? You know, I mean, why would it matter? But then I started thinking about it and I was like, well, chimpanzees are highly frugivorous and when they're not eating fruit, they're usually eating insects and they're usually eating meat and things of that nature. They don't do a lot of hard food stuff feeding on things like they require a lot of chewing, like foliage or roots and tubers. So I started thinking, okay, well, well then why wouldn't we have similar bite forces if we have similar diets, right? It turns out we do. <laughs> Human bite forces are significantly stronger than we previously thought. This is a paper from 2010, so it's not even, we've known this actually for quite some time, which is why I don't really have an excuse for not knowing it. Diminished bite force has long been considered a defining feature of modern Homo sapiens, an interpretation inferred from the application of two-dimensional lever mechanics and the relative gracility of the human masticatory musculature and skull. This conclusion has various implications with regard to the evolution of human feeding behavior. However, Human dental anatomy suggests a capacity to withstand high loads and two-dimensional lever models, greatly simplifying muscle architecture, yielding less accurate results than three-dimensional modeling using multiple lines of action. Here, to our knowledge, in the most comprehensive three-dimensional finite element analysis performed to date for any taxon, we ask whether the traditional view that the bite of Homo sapiens is weak and the skull too gracile to sustain high bite force is supported. We further introduce a new method for reconstructing incomplete fossil material. Our findings show that the human masticatory apparatus is highly efficient, capable of producing a relatively powerful bite using low muscle forces. Thus, relative to other members of the superfamily Hominoidea, humans can achieve relatively high bite forces, while overall stresses are reduced. Our findings resolve apparently discordant lines of evidence, i.e. the presence of teeth well adapted to sustain high loads within a lightweight cranium and mandible. So we've basically readjusted where we're putting force in our jaws, but we can apply exactly the same ballpark of bite force as a chimpanzee. So strong, powerful jaws, mm -mm, we got them. You got ape jaws around that, so I hope you're happy with that one. What's next? Immunity to infection, their complete immunity to infection. That's really stupid. Chimpanzees get infected with things all the time. That's why you have to wear masks like almost constantly when you are around them. I didn't back in Gombe, but they've been forcing this in areas like, um, uh, Rwanda for seeing uh, gorillas for a long time now, and I'll show you why. Wearing mask to see apes. Wearing a face mask when visiting the great apes. It's because they can catch nearly every infection that we can give them, Raw Matt. We give each other many of the same infectious diseases. In fact, although humans are more susceptible, as you note here in a moment, discussing how we can get things Let's see, what is it? Do you say exactly like um, AIDS, malaria, and cancer? Other great apes, specifically chimpanzees, are highly vulnerable to respiratory infections, which is why we have to wear masks around them, because we can infect them and they can infect us. One of the most famous chimpanzee outbreaks was a polio outbreak that occurred when Jane Goodall was doing her work at Gombe Stream National Park, which I have visited. So that's also just false, and you used the wrong there, so that makes you look even sillier, but whatever. I don't really care. I'm just doing this for fun. Okay, fur. Oh boy, fur. So this is another concept that I think requires a bit of conversation. So first of all, we have the exact same number, again, this is usually a range because individuals vary, of hair follicles that, that other great apes do, specifically chimpanzees. The difference is the coarseness of our hairs. Our hairs are very thin. And the reason why our hairs are very thin is so that we can take advantage of a very specific mutation that occurred in our eccrine uh, sweat gland production, right? Because we have, I think it's like three to five times the amount of sweat glands that a chimpanzee does because we're really, really, really efficient runners. We are one of the most efficient runners in the animal kingdom. So we sacrificed our long fur for ability to sweat. A chimpanzee would overheat in the savanna in about six seconds, which is why you don't see very many chimpanzees living in the savanna. And if they do, they usually live in what's called a mosaic environment. So we didn't, we, we have this lack of fur, which hurts us exactly 0% when we live in areas like the savanna, which is why modern hunter-gatherers 
like the Hadzabe, whom I've met, this is why they don't actually tend to wear too much clothes, except when they're around like tourists. Many of them don't wear many clothes at all. And if they do, it's usually decorative. So therein lies the question, well, <laughs> what about the ones who live in the North? Well, it's cold. Humans didn't evolve in the North. They evolved on the equator. They evolved in Africa on the savannah. So clothes, has, clothes have become more than anything, not like, look at this, this isn't keeping this guy warm. It's decorative in the same way that tattoos are. Clothing has become decorative along the equator and to the north it's useful in keeping us warm because we live in environments we weren't evolved to live in and we have not had time to adapt yet to the, or to uh, experience environmental adaptation to these locations. Okay, so we sunburn, they don't. Not all humans sunburn, Ramat, just the ones that are going and visiting areas where the, the sun exposure and UV radiation is high, that they don't actually have ancestry in. So if you're a white person from Europe and you go down and you visit the equator, you're going to crisp because your ancestors have not adapted nor experienced environmental adaptation to those locations. In fact, let's see here. Chimp sunburn. I'm curious to see if they actually do get sunburned. Because I'm pretty sure, uh-oh. They're showing Walkaris here. Chimps are extremely similar to humans. They do get sunburned, and they do get tan. Wrong again, Ramat. Really awesome. I just, I love all the work that you've been doing here. Yep, they bathe in the sun. And since they tan, they also burn. Listen, this thing has turned out to be monstrous. It's like three and a half hours long almost, so I'm gonna have to separate it into two pieces. I realize this is maybe an odd point to kind of cut that off, uh, a weird cutoff point, but it was very stream of consciousness and I was sitting in this chair for like half the day. Um, and I think three and a half hours is too long to sit to watch one of these things. So I'm going to chop it here. Um, and you can enjoy the rest of it maybe next week, whenever it comes out. So stay safe, my gentle and of course very modern apes. <laughs>